scripture. I know sometimes we beg for the Holy Spirit to show up, and it's not the um, it's not the Jesus Christ willies that we make it out to be. When the presence of a holy God shows up, it reveals things in your life automatically. When a righteous and holy God chooses to spend time with you, there's no hiding what you are and what He is. It's not just the feel goods that we get. Oh man, that really felt so good. That can be an end result. But when the presence of God shows up, it just reveals who we are and who He is. When the glory of God sweeps through a place, it just makes you realize He is everything. And we're not. And so when we sing and we we beg for that presence of the Holy Spirit, just understand the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and what that presence is going to come with. A presence is going to come with conviction, but also with encouragement. And so tonight, Matthew chapter 2, are we ready for the Christmas story? All right, we got some work to do in the Christmas story. And a lot of you are going to be mad, so let's go ahead and debunk a few things about the Christmas story. How many wise men were there? Ha! There's not three. We don't know how many there were. But Christmas carols lead us to believe that there are three what? Or three kings. They also were not kings. They were king makers. They identified kings. So continue to sing your Christmas carols. Just know that you're lying when you sing them. Okay? Also, the star was not in the east like our Christmas carols tell us. They were in the east. The star was in the west. If the star was in the east, then they weren't going to find Jesus. We need the star to be in the west because they're in the east. And so as we get into this, listen, I don't want the tradition of Christmas, I don't want this to be such a well-known story that you miss what Scripture has to say about this. I want us to hear what Scripture has to say. And and those are small things. But I just want to point that out to show you how culture makes us view Scripture rather than Scripture view culture. It's so easy for that to happen, how it shapes our views. And yet the meaning of these men showing up to find The baby Jesus, to find the Messiah, carries much more weight than the presents that they brought. Man, it has so much more to do with what God was revealing to the nations than just these three men showing up with presents. And so, last week we finished out Matthew chapter 1, and we just kind of talked about one thing. And as we're here in Matthew 2, and it's going to be the Christmas story, what do you think the main point of the Christmas story is? Jesus! Jesus. And so listen, I'm, I'm begging you, don't, don't fall asleep on me, don't, don't go numb on me, because we're in the Christmas story. Listen. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose, and we have come to worship. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And the assembly of all the chief priests and scribes of people He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So listen, you have this group of the wise men. You have this group of the magi coming. They see this sign appear. Now, how would they have possibly known just this star meant something of this magnitude? We've got to do some background and figure this out. And Scripture tells us who these men are. No. No. That's 
Christmas culture. The prophecies. Now, why would these Far East men, probably around the area of Persia, have anything to know about this? Yes, because the Bibles were a thing. All the way back in the book of Daniel, the Magi were very well respected. They were dream interpreters. They were even underneath King Nebuchadnezzar. And so they would have understood all the prophecies. These men were very well respected. And they would show up when kings were to be made. This was the point of the Magi. This is what they did. They were very religious. A lot of the things that they did and held to was right along with Jewish culture. These men had their place in society. But I want you to see something before we go any further. That God shows up in their world. Listen, they studied what was going on in the heavens. They were all the time looking for things to happen. And God so graciously shows up in their world in what they were doing to draw the nations to Himself. I told you that the book of Matthew was for who? The Jews. The Jews. And yet, Matthew is going to go to greater lengths than Luke did to make us understand that Jesus the Messiah was here for the nations. He was here for everyone. Listen, instead of it being the shepherds in Bethlehem, Matthew chooses to tell us about these men from a distant land. Up until this point, it had been, hey, Come see God. Come see God. The temple, Jerusalem. Now from here on out, it's God for the nations. The Messiah is not just for this country, but He's for the nations. And so we have these men coming to worship Jesus. We have these men traveling to worship Jesus. Now Herod is not happy about this. Why would Herod not be happy about this? Herod's kingdom is just hanging by a thread as it is anyways. He's all the time walking the line trying to balance what's happening. And if these men show up, that means there's a what on the way? A king on the way. And as we studied a few weeks ago, that's what Matthew wants us to understand. That the last and ultimate king was here. He was on the way. And these men are showing up because the prophecies are being fulfilled and the king is here. And Herod knows that he's going to be displaced. If this is true, if there's another king, if these men are searching, then his kingdom is in jeopardy. And so Herod calls the scribes and he calls the chief of priests and he asked them, where is Jesus to be born? And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So listen, there's a couple things going on I want us to take note of. Herod's got a problem with this. And your worship, listen, they're after Jesus to worship, okay? Understand that for no other reason. They're going to crown him king. They're going to say he's a king, but they're after, what does the text say? To worship him. That's what they're coming for, to bow down and worship. So there's two different people we see in this text. And listen, this is so important because this is our world, okay? We're going to hit home in so many places here in the Christmas story. You got two different people. You got church people on the scene. 
that Herod goes to. You got the scribes and the chief priests, right? The leaders of the church. Guess who doesn't go with the wise men in search of Jesus to worship? They go back to business as usual. These men show up from a distant land. Herod summons them. They should have known the prophecy. And yet, it did not move their heart so that they may go find the Messiah to worship. They just went back to business as usual. This is a group that I see all too often. The religious that should know, that should worship, that should be in search of a relationship with Jesus to worship. But their religion gets in the way of their true worship. Their activities of just doing business as usual gets in the way of them going with these men to find the Messiah to worship. Listen, these are the people that should have went. These are the people that should have been first on the scene. They had everything they needed to worship. But the Messiah was going to interrupt their plans. In search of a baby would interrupt their lifestyle. And so as Herod summons them, they have no care that this may be the Messiah. They have no, they just answer his question back to business as usual. And then we have Herod. Herod obviously doesn't want to worship. But yet he does something very interesting. He says that he wants to worship. But actually, he just wants rid of Jesus. Man, in our, our culture, listen, it, you can be divided into two groups. You're either going to be a worshiper and a follower of Jesus, or you want rid of Jesus. There is no in-between. There's nothing. We've whittled out the third group in our culture, haven't we? That I can partly worship Jesus. That I can do religious things without worshiping with my whole heart. You're either worshiping and in search or your Herod, you want rid of Jesus. Scripture's clear about that. And after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and what? Worshipped. So I want to spend a little bit of time here. First and foremost, I want us to understand that your true worship of Jesus has no regard for your dignity. Hear me. These men, these great men, Falling down to worship a baby. You understand that? A baby. They've traveled all this way to see a baby. You think that wasn't a little undignified? They fall down to worship an infant? These wise men, so highly regarded, would worship this baby in the house? And man, listen, such a beautiful picture for us. That if your worship is true, it has no regard for your dignity. Has no regard, no limits. But let me, let me tell you what happens. Man, we get to worship and we start worshiping in song and we're like this. I love you, Jesus. <laughs> listen, what, what's happening? Man, our regard for who we are in other people's eyes is more important than our worship of the Savior. I love you, but I'm going to be real. I don't want to pray like I do in church out in front of people because I don't want people to know how close I am because my dignity will take a shot. 
Man, I don't, I don't want to. I don't want people to hear me talk about Bible stuff out in public. Man, they're going to think I'm one of those people. Man, I don't want people to hear me singing those Christian songs. They're going to think I'm one of them. Man, I don't want to say to God be the glory and God did it all. Man, I, my pride will take a shot. My dignity will take a shot. And yet these men, not only did they put in the work to travel to find him, that's a whole nother message we'll get to, but they fall down at his feet to worship. And, and so let me just be very clear before we move on today. God did not call you God did not call you to just do religious activities. He called you to worship Him. There's no other way to follow Jesus Christ. There's not a checklist. There's not a part-time. But He called you to worship Him. That's what He's after. The worship of your heart. To be what you desire the most. And man, in a culture that says you look after you first, it's crept into the church. It's crept into Christianity. We think as long as I give God X amount of time, he'll be pleased with me. And yet scripture says throughout, worship me only. Worship the Lord your God only. So listen, if there's a 1A and 1B in your life, you stand guilty of not worshiping Him only. If two is even close to number one in your life, you're wrong. And I don't care what number two is. I don't care if it's family. I don't care if it's friends. I don't care if it's work. I don't care what it is. If two even comes close to where God's place is in your life, you're wrong. He wants your whole heart of worship. And man, just for weeks I've been begging and pleading with you to worship God, not, in he, not just in this place, but with your life. Because Scripture has so much to say about your life being worship. You say, well, I do worship Him. What else do you worship? Because He goes on to say, have no other gods before me. You say, well, I don't, I don't really worship anything else. What makes you make your decisions? Where's your time spent? You say, well, you don't understand what all I have to do. I know what all he's done for you. He deserves all of it. And yet I see us running around, making decisions with our life, not based on the worship of a holy God, but based on everything else in our life. So turn over with me. See what y'all ready? Old Testament. I'm just. I'm not gonna apologize for the Old Testament because it's the Word of God. I just want to lay it on you, Old Testament style. Jesus was very nice. You understand that when he came with his ministry, the ministry of grace was very nice compared to the Old Testament. I don't want us to ever lose grip of that. So Deuteronomy chapter six. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. We good? If you can't find it, just look at the front of your Bible. I'll tell you what page it's on. Almost no other book in all of the Old Testament is more quoted by Jesus during his ministry in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by His name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Hold on, we're going to read the last part of this in just a second. 
But let's talk about the gods of this world. What do we make gods in this culture? Oh, oh, yeah. Money. Social media. Ourselves. Lust. Lust. Oh, experiences. Yeah. Man, there's all these things that say, if you get to this mark, you will be complete. Man, if you can get here in your career, you'll be fulfilled. If you can find that unicorn of a woman or a man, you'll be fulfilled. You know, that one in a million, good luck. If you can get here, you'll be complete. Listen, we're not all that different from the peoples of other nations. They had gods for everything. They had a specific God for this, a specific God for that. And the warning is, do not chase after their gods. And the warning today is still the same. Don't chase after the other gods. Don't chase after the gods of this world. Don't. You shall have one God. And you shall serve Him only. Now listen. For the Lord your God is in, in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from the face of the earth. How many of you are thankful for grace? Say amen. Because this, listen, this was here. He's a jealous God. You read your Old Testament. Every time they begin to turn to other gods, he didn't mess around. Snakes showed up. People started getting sicknesses. He started sending in other, other countries to destroy them. Listen, he's serious about this. And while we are, are under the law of grace, hear me when I say this. You begin to turn to other gods and the same promise is still true. He will destroy them. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus and He is not your affection and your worship, He will begin to tear out everything else in your life until He becomes your worship. For those of you who have not said yes to Jesus, He will do something even worse. Romans 1 says that He'll allow you just to keep pursuing those things and never again come after your heart. Now you think about that. He said, I'm your God, and I'm a jealous God. How many of you have ever, uh, I don't know how to word this. How many of you have ever been in a jealous relationship? Oh, y'all are lying. Y'all are lying. It's okay. You don't, maybe the person's here, and you don't want to raise your hand. It's fine. But listen, you know how it is when somebody, what are you doing? Where are you going? Who are you talking to? You know that? Who are you spending your time with? What's happening? Listen, the words that are used here, understand this. Where are you spending your time at, Christian? Why are you chasing that? I'm supposed to be the object of your affection. Why are you over there? I'm willing to remove the things that your attention set on so that I'm the center of your attention. As Christians, listen to me. And I'm begging and I'm pleading with you. And I'm asking God to reveal these things so we turn them over and surrender them rather than Him reaching out and pulling them out of your life. This is the words of Scripture. That I'm a jealous God. And I will have your affection. Listen, our worship, our worship is what He wants. Turn over with me to Luke. Luke chapter 4. See, Jesus isn't after your behavior modification. You realize that? 
I'm glad that you're doing better as a good human and a good human as a part of society. That's good. I'm glad. I don't like bad humans. But that's not what Jesus is after. Jesus isn't after part of you. Jesus isn't after you becoming a better you. I didn't name any names, but that should fall on you a certain way. He could care less about that. He has been and always will be after your worship. Always. And Satan understands this. That your worship is at the center of everything else. Because if you ever get a hold of worshiping a holy God, everything else will fall into place. Because as you worship, your behavior changes according to what you worship. It's at the heart of everything. As God changes your heart and He becomes worthy of your worship, I don't have to tell you how to be a better friend, a better husband, a better wife, a better person. Because as you're worshiping a holy God, He changes you. But at the center of that, you have to be worshiping. Because if you're worshiping something else, that's what's going to change your behavior. Whatever you worship, you will start to become. Period. If it's, if it's video games that you work, I don't worship video games. I just play them nine hours a day. It affects your sleeping patterns. It affects your eating patterns. If it's um, your hobby, guess what? That's where you spend your money. The whole time you're doing something else, you're thinking about the next time you get to your hobby. That's what changes you. That's why worship has to be at the heart of everything. How many times do we think about, man, I can't wait to just worship Jesus. Man, I want to get home and get on my knees before Jesus and worship Him. And so I'll cut these things short so I can get home and worship Him. And I'll just be honest, I've never been hanging out with people that said, hey man, i got to cut this short, i got to get home and worship Jesus. I've been with people that say, hey man, i got to get home. i got stuff to do tomorrow. i got to go hang out with these people. I've never been with anybody that says, hey man, i got to get home, i got to spend time with Jesus. Man, our worship, it affects everything that we do. So I'm just going to pick on Cain for a second because he's mine and I can. Listen, this kid doesn't need anything. All right? He's nothing. He's his hamburgers plain. He doesn't need any sauces. There's about six things that he'll eat. If I ask him to this day to try something new, he would rather be grounded for a week than try new food. And I'm not even kidding. It's happened. Okay? But all of a sudden, he meets this brown-haired girl. Okay. And he goes over for the first family dinner and he's eating eggplant and salad, drinking smoothies. Now, listen, I've threatened to beat him within an inch of his life if he doesn't eat his dinner and he'll take the beating. But she shows up and now all of a sudden he's eating this stuff. What happened? She was important enough to change his behavior. She was important enough to make him different. I'm a jealous God. And when he is the center of your affection, it'll make you different. You'll want to spend that time with him. You won't want the things of this world, but you just can't wait to get back at his feet and worship Man, it's not I spend too much time doing this Christian stuff. It's how can I whittle out a few more hours to spend for the kingdom? Man, I can't wait to get back in my prayer closet. Man, I just want to be next to the Savior. What our affections are set on will change how you make your decisions. And so Satan is going to use whatever he can to draw your worship. He does the same to Jesus. 
Luke chapter 4, verse 5. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you I will give this authority and their glory. That's pretty brazen by Satan, isn't it, by the way? I'll give you this. I know you're God, but I'll give it. We'll deal with that later. For it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. You know what Satan's tempting him with here? Not only a lesser way than the cross, but Satan's after his worship because Satan knows how important worship is. Satan understands to worship the Lord your God and the Lord your God only. And so he puts these tempting things even in front of Jesus that I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, which is what you're after. You desire all men to be saved. I'll give you these kingdoms if you'll just change your worship to me. And I'm just telling you right now, present today, the tactic hasn't changed. I'll give you this. Just worship it. Here. Here's that career you wanted. Here's that person you wanted. Here's the money you wanted. Here's the stuff you wanted. He's just after you to worship those things. That's what he's after. Because if he can just get your heart the slightest bit off the worship of God, then you're in trouble. And your life will begin to follow those actions. Your decisions will begin to be based on those things rather than the worship of God. And he wins. He wins that way. Because a heart that is set on the worship of God is everything that He wants from us. And man, that's what Satan's after. And it doesn't even have to be bad things. Do you understand that? Most of the time, it's the very blessings that you receive that He takes and turns into something that is wrong for you to worship. Man, I just tell, I see parents all the time worship their kids. You say, aren't you supposed to put... No. No, you're not. Not only does it make them unhealthy, spoiled brats, but they were given to you as a gift from the one you should be worshiping. So what happens when God calls that kid to a life that scares you to death? And you don't want to give him back to the one that gave him to you. Man, I see it all the time. And what about that job that God's blessed you with? He gave you that. It's a good way. But you elevate it to a place it shouldn't be. You ruin it. Man, it's sometimes it's the very gift that He gives us that Satan creeps in and he turns our eyes from them being a blessing and he makes them the ultimate things in our life. And we begin to worship God. Those things. And I know some of you are sitting here and you're saying, worship is a strong word. Listen, I'm just telling you, where you spend your time, your money, and your attention is what you worship. Call it what you want, but it's what you worship. Jesus says this, you shall worship the Lord your God and Him only shall you serve. You see that little four-letter word in there? Only. Only. Listen, your affection, period, is to be set on Jesus. Everything else is so far in the background, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Are you saying I can't do nothing besides just be a Christian? What I'm saying is you should be a Christian first and worship Jesus first and whatever else time you have, do what you want. But that's what worship looks like. Everything else is secondary. None of the things in your life that you have outside of Jesus can carry the weight of being your God anyways. 
You put it on your significant other and you'll ruin that relationship. You put it on your money and guess what? You're going to lose it. It's not enough to complete you. It's not enough for your worship. Only He is. Only He is worthy of your worship. And listen, we get so close and we toe the line as Christians. Man, I worship Him. He's my everything. This right here, I'm going to drag this right along with me. I'm going to make it real close. And He's so clear in Scripture that He'll have all your attention and all your worship or nothing. Listen, I'm not trying to be too hard on us. But there's a world that needs to see a difference in us. And yet Christians' passions and how we spend our time and how we spend our money, man, it's just the same as the world. We just put Jesus next to it. And we're all after the same thing, it looks like. We all just want comfortability. We all want the American dream. Man, that can be your God and what you worship so quickly. Just over and over again, Jesus says, I'm a je- God says, I'm a jealous God. I'll have all of your worship because I'm worthy of all your worship. Back in Matthew. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Let me just be, let me ask you a direct question. You don't have to answer out loud. It's fine. We're on camera. It's the last time you worried, you worshiped with exceeding joy. Not saying, listen, don't get me confused. Not saying with exceeding joy. When's the last time you worship God for who he is? with exceeding joy because of what you've been given. Not in hopes for anything else. You didn't worship today because you hoped tomorrow would be different. When's the last time you worshiped with exceeding joy because of what He's done for you? That's the heart of worship. That's where we're supposed to be Listen, these men came, they bowed their dignity. Not only were they willing to bow their dignity, but they left it all at the door and worshiped with exceeding joy because they had found what they were looking for. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Listen, not only were they willing to put their dignity to the side, not only were they willing to worship with exceeding joy, but they were willing to lay their gifts down at the baby's feet. They were willing to lay down not only their dignity, not only be happy about laying it down, but they were willing to lay what they held dear down at His feet. Because He was worthy of those things. Now, before you get uncomfortable and think I'm preaching on Tyler, I'm not. Listen to me. There's a lot more things more important than your money. What are you holding on to that you're not willing to turn over for the worship of Him? What are you not willing to lay down at His feet? Listen, they went on a search and they worshiped with joy. And they were willing to set everything aside And that gold and that frankincense and that myrrh meant nothing to them because they found what they were looking for. They were willing just to lay it down. Here you go. Because you're worthy of it. You're worthy to be worshipped. Not only do you have me here, but I'm willing to lay this down to worship you. I'm willing to give these gifts And so 
tonight you may be saying, I, I don't know, I feel like I do a pretty good job. Let me ask you. Let me ask you just real point. And maybe you can't figure out what it is that you're worshiping, but it's not Jesus. Whatever it is that can't be pried out of your closed hand, that's what it is. Whatever dream, whatever thing you have your hand so tight around, you're not willing to lay on the table for the sake of the kingdom, that's what it is. Listen, they were willing to bring it and lay it down because they found what they were looking for. The heart of a, of a worshipful person is open-handed with everything. With everything you got. Your time, your resources, your affection, with everything. Man, we see these men from the nations with all the things of what it's supposed to look like to be a follower of Jesus. And how easy do we just skip over it? But man, they had it right with their worship. They had it right. They were willing to put their self to the side. They were willing to have joy because of what they found. And they were willing to lay the gifts down at His feet. See, their gifts weren't ultimate. They didn't walk into the house and go, I don't look like no king to me. I'm taking my gold back. This baby, it's him. Here it is. Here it is. Here's everything on the table. You got it. Finishing out. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And close out, I want you to turn to Ezekiel 16. I don't know how many of you have read the book of Ezekiel, but I'm just telling you, one day we'll get there. Again, grace. Thank you, Jesus. Grace. He's speaking, he's speaking to the Israelites. But listen to me. Couldn't better describe our country. Uh, Listen, I'm not changing the prophetic meaning of this. I'm not changing what it means. I'm just telling you, we're here. We're here. Starting in verse 9. And I'm not putting it up on the screen because we can read along together because there's a lot of verses. Then I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed you with oil. And I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. And I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. And thus you were adorned with gold and silver and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. And you ate fine flour and honey and oil. And you grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. For it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Listen, he's talking to his people. Let me just say, God has blessed this country. Once upon a time. So how do you know that? Because we're free to do this right here. He did. But then. But you trusted in your beauty and played the whore because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby. Your beauty became his. You took some of your garments and made for yourself colorful shrines and on them played the whore. 
The like has never been nor shall ever be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and of my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself images of men, and with them played the whore. And you took your embroidered garments to cover them and set my oil, my incense before them, and also my bread that I give you. And I fed you with fine flour and oil and honey, and you set before them a pleasing aroma. And so it was, declares the Lord your God. And you took your sons and your daughters, whom you had borne to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your whoring so small a matter that you slaughtered my children and delivered them up as an offering by fire to them? And in all your abominations and your whorings, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and wallowing in your blood. And after all your wickedness, woe, woe to you, declares the Lord God. You built for yourself vaulted chambers and made yourself a lofty place in every square. At the head of every street, you built your lofty place and made your beauty an abomination, offering yourself to any passing by and multiplying your whoring. Listen, listen, the very gifts that he was talking about giving this country is what he's talking about became their God. The goodness that he had bestowed upon them became their ultimate, became all they cared about. And they were willing to chase after all these other things. Just read about them. Every time something new came along, they ran after it. Every time a new God showed up, a new people showed up, Every time something happened, they ran after it. And man, if I can see anything on display in our church world in this country, it's the good things that God has blessed us with. The good things that God gives us as gifts, we just run after them and make shrines to them. The very things that He gave us, we make them idols in His place. You see, I gave you flour to eat and you offered it to them, the things that you chase after. God said, I gave you, I gave you that family and you're willing to just offer it. I gave you that job and you're willing to go spend all your money over here. I gave you that. I gave you that flour. I gave you those things. Everything was mine. Listen, I know this is tough, but this is Scripture. And this is what happens when our eyes get off worshiping Him and get on the things that He's given us. This is very direct to these people that I've been good to you. And you've done this. You've made it into a place where I was supposed to be. And this is what he has to say to them. Skip down to verse 42. Not because the rest of it is not important, but because there's a lot there to cover. So, so will I satisfy my wrath on you, and my jealousy shall depart from you. I will be calm and no more be angry, because you have not remembered the days of your youth, but have enraged me with all these things. Therefore, behold, I have returned your deeds upon your head, declares the Lord God. Have you not committed lewdness in addition to all your abominations? Did you catch what he said? He said, I will no longer be jealous. And I will no longer be angry. The only thing more scary than a jealous and angry God is the God that chooses to pull that away to tell you you're in the wrong. That's the only thing more scary because guess what? He's going to let the things you're chasing after become the things that you continue to chase after. He said, I'll pull my jealousy and my anger. You know how to tell when somebody's done with your relationship? When they're not jealous or angry anymore. They say, I don't care. Do what you're going to do. Have it. Do it. This is what he tells them. No longer. I'm just going to heap your deeds back upon your head. And, and I can't help but be broken hearted and think about the church in the midst of this. 
to think about his church that he died for. He sacrificed, and yet our worship and affection is not on him. For him to say, no longer will I be jealous for you. No longer will I be angry for you. Here you go. And I'm not saying we're here yet, but I don't think we're far off. God to say, listen, if this is what you want, here you go. Have it. Worship it. The beautiful part about this chapter is at the end of this chapter, he says, but because I've made a covenant with you, I will restore you. You will be shameful, but you will no longer open your mouth because you will remember the days of your youth. Now listen, if the Magi come, if they come from the nations to worship the baby. I don't want us to just see men and wise men coming to visit a baby, but rather the heart of what it looks like to worship. What it actually means to worship. Because we have a jealous God. We have a God that wants your affections and only your affections. And so I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm begging you to not play around with following Jesus, to not play around with where your worship lies. If this hits you tonight, then deal with it. Deal with what your affections are set on. Not tomorrow, not later on. Deal with it tonight. Because that's the God that we serve. And if you're going to call yourself a Christian, then it starts with the worship of your life. It starts with the worship in your life for Him. And everything else will be bred out of that. You get that right, and everything else will be a piece of cake. You set your affections on Him and Him only, and it'll change you. Everything else, behavior modification. It's not following Jesus. So as we pray and we're going to sing, listen, I know it's tough. But listen, we get a picture of what worship looks like right from the get-go as Jesus arrives. Right from the get-go, we get a picture of worship. Man, I want to be a people that worship Jesus. Not just in here, but with our lives. Because that's what he's after. If he was will, if Satan was willing to tempt Jesus Christ himself with worship of other things, you think that's not how he's going to come after you? Listen, this picture of the Magi. Lay aside your dignity. Lay aside the things you hold dear and be willing to worship Jesus. That's the true picture of being a follower. To be willing to lay all that down and worship at His feet. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I pray tonight that you would have that God you would have our worship God I'm sorry things either take your place or come to God I pray that the cross would be so real in our hearts God that forgiveness and salvation would be so real in our hearts God that we couldn't help but live a life of worship, God. God, I pray that we don't take the good blessings that you've given us, God, and make them into more than what they were ever supposed to be, God. God, we want to be a people that just worship you. God, I ask, to the things that are in the way, God. By any means necessary, God, I pray that you would just remove those, God. God, I pray that you would do the work of 
us turning them over, but God, for those things that we're so closed-handed about, I pray that you would just come and get them, God. God, I pray that you don't leave us to ourselves. God, I pray that you don't ever get to a point where you're no longer jealous of us, God. God, I pray that you would break our hearts tonight. God, I pray that we would just worship with our life, God. You are so worthy of everything and so much more than we could ever do, God. But God, I pray tonight you would just help us to give over a little more and a little more each day, God. God, that the things of this world would just grow dim in our view, God. God, nothing but a kingdom mentality for us. And God, we hold you up so high, nothing even comes close in the light of your glory, God. God, I pray tonight that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would do the work of the honest confessions of the things that we hold closest in our heart, God. God, I pray you would just reveal those things to us. God, change us as a people. And God, for any of those out here tonight, God, anybody listening, God, that has not said yes to you, God, I pray that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Tonight would be the night they choose to worship you for the rest of their life. So God, thank you for scripture. God, thank you for just the humble story of how you stepped into our world, God. God, thank you for the picture of worship in Scripture. So God, be with us as we leave this place. God, don't let our worship die as we get done singing tonight, God. God, I pray that we would worship with exceeding gladness and joy in our hearts for who you are. God, I pray that as we step into our worlds tomorrow, God, we would just tell people of who you are and the one that we worship. So God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for everything you're going to do from tonight. It's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.